संसार दावा नंदनीर लोका प्राणाय पारिन घना घना क्यं सकलन Hi there, Krishna, everyone. Welcome back. I want to thank every one of you for your support and concern for the protection of our children. In 2016, the Cost of Silence documentary covered historic and current child abuse in the Hare Krishna movement. Today, I will go over some of the more important developments we've had since. Although we still have much room for improvement, I'm glad to report that we have witnessed some significant victories for child protection. After much deliberation, the Board of Directors of the Bhakti Center in New York has reached a decision that Dhanadar Swami is no longer welcome to give classes or hold any position of relevance in their temple. Bhaktivedya Purna Maharaj is now officially banned from having any involvement whatsoever with children. He is no longer welcome to speak at many ISKCON temples around the world and he is not allowed to reside in on the school campus in Mayapur. As many of you know, Lakshmi Moni Devi Dasi was a Gurukula teacher for almost three decades. Last year, the CPO issued a groundbreaking verdict finding her guilty of sexual, physical and emotional abuse of the children in her care. These are landmark victories that set important precedents for child protection in ISKCON. I know that many share my gratitude and appreciation for all those who've helped make them possible. Unfortunately, this is the end of the good news and the list of bad ones is considerably longer. Bhaktivedya Purna Maharaj is still invited to preside over some school functions and festivals, which is in breach of his restrictions. And I have just received news that the GBC is looking to overturn Lakshmi Moni's verdict. But let's proceed chronologically. I'll get back to Lakshmi Moni in a bit. Only a few days after the documentary was released, Anuttama Prabhu published a 14-page response document where he made a considerable effort to whitewash and minimize the severity of the child protection problem in ISKCON. A few months later, I met Anuttama in Yuvrindavan. We spoke at length, and I suggested putting together a group of Gurukula alumni that could meet with the GBC in Alachua and help tackle the crisis in the Indian Gurukulas. Anuttama declined the offer and assured me that the GBC had everything under control. Let's see how well they have fared. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. As many of you know, in 2008, Gopal Krishna Maharaj took over the management of the Vrindavan Gurukul along with Lila Purushottam and Radha Kanta. In the cost of silence, I pointed out that under their management, child abuse was rampant in the school. In 2017, a 13-year-old boy drowned in the Vrindavan Gurukul swimming pool. The police described the incident as a case of negligence on the part of the school management. In 2018, the CPO submitted to the GBC a shocking 20-page report on the Vrindavan Gurukul. The report only covers a period of 73 days. Over this time period, a total of 62 cases of child abuse were reported, 49 within the school and 13 involving the temple, and 8 teachers were implicated. The report highlights a culture of intimidation, denial and minimization of the abuse, non-compliance with sanctions and severe inadequacies in the education, care and protection of the children. They abused almost one child every day. This is industrial scale child abuse. You'd think they were in the business of abusing children. But it gets worse. This may just be the tip of the iceberg. Students themselves say a significant number of students don't speak out about any type of abuse out of fear of being suspended. Some teachers have asked for private meetings in an alternative location. They have privately voiced their fears of losing their jobs if they speak about what they see. The report also raises concerns about the plan to relocate the school to a more remote facility where the number of students is expected to increase significantly and the school will be under less scrutiny, which will further compromise the safety of the children. Gopal Krishna Maharaj has raised millions of dollars for this new school, off the back of these children, promising donors that he will ensure their protection and well-being, that he will raise wholesome Krishna conscious human beings. 
But all the while, these children are literally being used as cannon fodder. If the protection of our children is not sacred, then what is? Despite this damning report, the GBC voted to allow this very management to continue running the school. This vote is an indictment of the entire GBC body. It tells me that the GBC have a very loose grasp of reality. They have effectively endorsed the abuse of the past and enabled further abuse. Grasping the significance of the mindset that is behind this vote is essential to understanding why the GBC has been largely unsuccessful in tackling the child abuse problem in ISKCON. This vote says that they either don't care or don't understand the importance of children. And how can we hope that the Vrindavan Gurukula management will ever care when the GBC clearly doesn't? The solution has to come from an entirely different paradigm. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Two years ago, a 17-year-old boy died in Mayapur of an opium overdose, but somebody over there decided to report the incident as a heart attack. The implications of an opium overdose would have represented a major scandal for the Mayapur community, whereas a heart attack? It's a more acceptable natural cause. In 2015, the CPO found that Sri Rade posed a threat to the safety and well-being of children and banned her from having any involvement with minors. Sri Rade has decided to disregard his restrictions and is now teaching from her home. Technically speaking, the jurisdiction of the CPO is restricted to ISKCON property and projects. While her house may not be on ISKCON property, the fact that she's teaching in Mayapur to children from the ISKCON community is clearly a violation of her restrictions. Her case file specifically says that if she is found in breach of her sanctions, she will be prohibited from having any affiliations with ISKCON. The history of child abuse in Mayapur is one of the worst in ISKCON. To date, the local devotees have not been able to set up a reliable system to prevent and tackle these issues. And due to its close-knit power structure, it's also been notoriously difficult for outsiders to do anything. Mayapur has been without an active child protection team for over a year now, and as far as I'm aware, they haven't reported any incidents besides the death of the boy. Now, the chances that all of a sudden they have actually stopped having any incidents at all are quite slim. And if the report on the Vrindavan Gurukul is anything to go by, then it's safe to assume that they have probably just stopped reporting incidents altogether. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. In 2017, I had an exchange with Bhakti Vikash Maharaj, where he made his best effort to justify the use of corporal punishment on children. I explained to him that taking into account ISKCON's history of extreme abuse, if he was going to publicly endorse the use of corporal punishment, at the very least he had the responsibility to give very clear guidelines. He promised that he would shortly elaborate on the specific instances where he felt that it was acceptable to use corporal punishment. He also promised that he would write to defend Indrajumna Swami's unorthodox interactions with young women and children. Almost two years have passed and we're still eagerly awaiting to hear back from Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. Now, there is good touch and there is bad touch. For the most part, the intention of the adult is crucial, but there are certain boundaries that must never be crossed regardless. Touching a child anywhere near their groin area is never okay. This is inappropriate. Placing the hand of a child near your groin area is also dangerously inappropriate. Hugs are generally okay, but this hug is not okay. Would you feel comfortable if this was your child? 
I got a lot of flack for including Indradyumna Maharaj in the cost of silence. The point I want to make is that even if his intentions are 100% genuine, like many believe, his conduct remains problematic. By normalizing inappropriate behavior, Indradyumna Maharaj is making these children more vulnerable to predators, he is setting a bad example for his followers, and he's making himself vulnerable to false allegations and criticisms. There is absolutely no need for any of this. I am convinced that Maharaj can successfully convey encouragement and support of these children in a manner that is safe, respectful, and considerate of social norms. After the video came out, I received many letters from devotees worldwide. They were saying, we really support what you're trying to do. Child protection is really important, but, and all these letters came with a similar objection, which is, why did you include my favorite Swami or Guru in the documentary? Naturally, the names of the Swamis change depending on friendships and preferences, but otherwise these letters are very similar. The best way I can describe what I saw is as a collective, sentimental blind spot of sorts. If a stranger was to have the same questionable interactions with our children, there would be no difficulty recognizing them as inappropriate. But when it's somebody we like and respect, someone we are emotionally and spiritually invested in, then we minimize or justify that very same behavior. Essentially, we operate with different sets of standards. Everyone supports child protection until doing so comes at a personal or emotional cost. Then things become complicated. Some have pointed out that the poor judgment ISKCON's leadership has shown with regards to child protection does not negate their positive accomplishments. After all, they have helped and inspired hundreds of thousands to chant the holy names. Surely that has to count for something. The thing is that while this may be true from an absolute transcendental platform, that's not how things work in the world we live in. If you're a model citizen, your entire life the nicest, most religious and considerate person to everyone you meet, and then you go on to abuse just one child, that's it. You become a child abuser. And that one action will cast a long, dark shadow over every other aspect of your life. This shadow will be so dark that no amount of good will ever wash it away completely. One of the main topics covered in the cost of silence was the urgent need for ISKCON to allocate more funding towards child protection. At the time, the GBC was only giving $8,000 a year. How far can you get with $8,000? How many ISKCON Western sannyasis could survive for an entire year on this budget? And somehow the CPO is supposed to work the international operation with that much money. I suggested redirecting 1% of the TOVP money towards child protection, and believe it or not, this was briefly discussed by the GBC. I have here with me an email where they talk about the proposal. But Drinarayan Swami wrote, Frankly, to me, the issue of child abuse is so toxic and our response has been so anemic, at least in regards to funding, that the need to address funding in a serious way is starkly clear. Don't forget that child abuse, and even more so, the abysmal response of its leadership are what has tarnished the Catholic Church's reputation beyond repair. What many devotees don't seem to understand is that the GBC has been aware of the extent of the child abuse problem for many years. Their apathy is really inexcusable. Unfortunately, Shivaram Swami objected. He argued that 1% is an arbitrary figure and that the GBC really needs a breakdown of the actual costs. He pointed out that child protection is just one out of endless projects that need GBC support. Now, these may have been reasonable objections. Accountability is important after all, isn't it? The problem is that Shivaram Sami's intervention effectively torpedoed the discussion. The idea got shelved, and today the GBC still only allocates about $8,000 a year for child protection. We all know that money talks louder than words. Show me where you spend your money and I will tell you what you value. It turns out that Shivaram Swami and Bhakti Charu Swami are the only GBCs that currently donate to child protection from their own pockets. Most of the other GBCs have made repeated pledges but never delivered. 
What does $8,000 a year towards child protection from an international multi-million dollar institution say about the values and priorities of this institution? And if children are the seeds of the future, what does this say about the prospects of ISKCON? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Despite some exceptional challenges, the verdict issued on Lakshmi Moni was a huge victory for child protection last year. Unfortunately, I've just found out that the GBC has set up a clandestine task force to reverse the verdicts on Lakshmi Moni and Sri Rade. Rudainanda Maharaj and Malati Mataji have been the most vocal voices championing this revision. A few years back, Malati also came out to defend another child abuser, Varkeshwar Pandit. The interesting thing is that none of these senior devotees who've been so bent out of shape over Lakshmi Moni's verdict have even read their case file. They're literally just complaining because she's their friend. Rudainanda Maharaj claims that his concern is purely about fairness of procedure, which sounds rather noble, of course. But bear in mind that last year, both Rudainanda Maharaj and Malati voted, along with the rest of the GBC body, to keep the current Vrindavan Gurukula management, despite the damning report. Where was their burning sense of justice then. Why didn't we see them start a campaign to object to a vote that effectively endorsed the abuse of hundreds of children? But now they're kicking and screaming because they're supposedly concerned with fairness of procedure in Lakshmi's case, and we're supposed to believe them. I'm going to spare you the gory details of Lakshmi sexual abuse. But I will say that looking at the case files of both Lakshmi Moni and Sri Rade, they have at least two things in common. The first is the systematic and exceptional degree of cruelty they displayed towards their students. It is important to understand that we're not talking about one-off uh, light offenders here that under pressure slipped up and made a mistake. They're both serious abusers on multiple counts and their offenses span over the course of several years. Interestingly, they also employed some of the exact same methods of abuse. The second thing they have in common is that the only reason their cases are being contested is because both of them have powerful and influential friends. Rudainanda Maharaj has never cared or objected to any of the 400 plus CPO adjudications over the last 20 years. It is really unfortunate to see him show up so late in the game to protect one of ISKCON's most notorious female child abusers. Officially, this task force is supposed to review the fairness of the policies and procedure of the CPO. Now, I'm sure everyone will agree that a transparent, unbiased, and professional review of CPO policies can only be a good thing, right? Technically speaking, yes, absolutely. I would be the first to support that. But there are at least four major reasons to be concerned here. The first is that there is zero transparency to this task force. The entire operation is shrouded in a cloak of secrecy. And if we have learned anything from history, it is precisely that when the GBC takes an interest in CPO matters, secrecy is never a good thing. The second reason for concern are the actual members of this task force. To begin with, they're all lawyers, which in and of itself raises alarm bells. I mean, we're talking about revising child protection policies. Why lawyers? I can appreciate that nowadays you can't do anything without a lawyer. But here we have four lawyers and zero child protection professionals. We wouldn't trust a mechanic to defend us in court. Why do we have four lawyers to review our child protection procedures? The third and perhaps the most serious reason for concern is the track record and evident bias of the individuals who make up the task force. We have Shesha, an old friend of Lakshmi Moni, who despite being a GBC, the Minister of Justice and Education, he has protected Bhaktivedya Purna Maharaj and a few other known child abusers in the past. Then we have Radha Dasi, who also has a long-standing friendship with Lakshmi Moni. She had to be removed as the case officer during Lakshmi Moni's adjudication on account of her biased and unprofessional conduct. The third lawyer is Champakalata Devidasi. When she served as the CPO director on the case of Sri Rade, she demonstrated a lack of professional integrity. The fourth lawyer is a devotee from Singapore called Devakinandan Das. Last year, when Lakshmi Moni was considering appealing the CPO adjudication, he offered to be her defense counselor. 
The one thing these lawyers have in common is that none of them have any professional qualifications in the field of child protection. At the very least, the GBC should have selected a group of credible and impartial individuals. The fourth reason for concern is their agenda. Despite the fact that the stated purpose of this task force is the review of the fairness of CPO policies, that's not what they're looking at. They have essentially taken the cases of Lakshmi and Sri Rade, placed them under a microscope, and they're trying to find anything to invalidate the verdicts. So they're not investigating because the cases were mishandled, they're investigating to try and find some discrepancies. This is unprecedented. The GBC has never opened an inquiry into a closed CPO case looking for reasons to invalidate the verdict. If only they'd shown this much concern to protect the children. Over the years, the CPO has processed hundreds of cases. Let's assume that somehow they uncover some shortcomings in CPO procedures. What are they going to do? Just reverse their friend's adjudication? Or will they review every CPO case since 1997? They are so set on exonerating them that they will grasp at any pretext to try and invalidate the verdict. They have gone to the extent of questioning the validity of Lakshmi's adjudication on some allegations that one of the judges may have been struggling with the regs. You couldn't make this up. Everyone knows that the GBC were perfectly happy to allow Prabhu Vishnu Swami, Balabhadra and others to continue as initiating gurus for years after they found out that they were not following their vows. Should we investigate how many ISKCON leaders are following the regs? And of course, we also have Lokanath Maharaj, who molested an 11-year-old girl. When the allegations against Lokanath Maharaj first came out, there was a lot of interference from some GBC members. They specifically instructed the CPO not to investigate the case of Maharaj. In a relatively recent attempt at damage control, the GBC have decided that Lokanath Maharaj is only allowed to initiate in India. I not quite sure how limiting his field of initiation to India is somehow more acceptable. We also experienced a similar pattern in the cases of Sri Radha and Lakshmi Moni. Some GBCs pressure the CPO to give them a preferential treatment. In short, if you have influential friends, the rules are different. In Italy, we call this nepotism. I am concerned that the GBC will now look to replace the current CPO director, likely with someone that has a more flexible moral compass. What's really curious here is that in the last 50 years, the GBC has cared nowhere near enough for women and children, but now they show up with the cavalry to protect their child abuser friends. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. If the GBC will resort to underhanded tactics to exonerate Lakshmi Moni and Sri Rade, they will simply bring more disgrace on themselves and on the society they are supposed to serve and protect. Many brave women came forward to testify to the abuse they suffered at the hands of Lakshmi Moni. Before and during the adjudication, they had to face bullying, opposition and hostility from some of the most senior and powerful leaders in ISKCON. None of these leaders showed any concern for how their interference affected Lakshmi Moni's victims. Ridainanda Maharaj, Malati Devi Dasi, Radha Dasi, Pragosh Das, and Brahmatirta Das, they all defended Lakshmi but not one senior leader sided with the victims. The testimonies of these victims are confidential, and it would be a mistake for the CPO to release their statements to be scrutinized by Lakshmi lawyer friends. At the very least, they need to get the permission of the victims. In the past, when protecting children has conflicted with GBC interests, they have often sacrificed child protection. This short-sighted mindset needs to change. This is the root of the child protection problem of the Hare Krishna movement. Unless we can raise the vibration of this consciousness, there is little hope to see any real change. 
any sensible person that will carry out an in-depth study of the history of child protection in ISKCON will struggle to maintain a good opinion of the leadership. This reminds me of a quote from Spotlight. If it takes a village to raise a child, it also takes a village to abuse a child. Because it takes the entire village or society to support the environment that is conducive to the abuse of children. But more importantly, we will need the whole village to change how ISKCON views and prioritizes child protection. From a spiritual perspective, nothing is worse than destroying the faith of a jiva. Child abuse often destroys the faith of the victims. But when the leadership is complicit and complacent, then the faith of thousands is affected. As the number of victims continues to mount, a question becomes more and more pressing every day. How many more children will have to be sacrificed before the GBC takes decisive action? I'm not talking about another facade or pretend fix, waiting and hoping that the storm blows over. I'm talking about concrete and tangible improvements. We need a drastic makeover. Only a couple of days ago, the Pope held a summit dedicated to addressing the child abuse that has plagued the Catholic Church for decades. He announced that condemning is not enough. He said that the Church needs to deliver concrete and effective measures. A spokesperson for the Vatican stated that it is time to look in the face of this monster, referring to child abuse. I'd say it is time for the Hare Krishnas to do the same. You know, taking into account that the Hare Krishnas are in great part responsible for making the word karma a household name in the Western world, we really don't behave like we believe in karma. ISKCON cannot continue business as usual, assuming that abusing its children will have no consequences. I invite the devotee community to request that the GBC act with the transparency and integrity that the protection of our children deserve. On the one hand, it is important to acknowledge that there is no magic bullet. There is not any one resolution the GBC can pass that will make the problem go away. On the other, we also need to recognize that ISKCON cannot resolve its child abuse problems without addressing its leadership accountability crisis. ISKCON needs to hold leaders accountable for enabling, concealing and protecting child abusers. The GBCs are concerned that the CPO may be inadequate, but they've been starving it of resources. Why don't we start with $200,000 a year? It would be a drop in the bucket for ISKCON, but it would be a game changer for the CPO. Imagine what could be achieved if the CPO was adequately funded. They could hire actual professionals to create a world-class child protection program beyond reproach. The positive PR ISKCON would get from such an investment would be incredible. Imagine what the world would look like in 20 years if the current generation of Vaishnava children was adequately cared and protected. Considering the social trend of what is taking place in religious establishment worldwide, it is only a matter of time before ISKCON leaders will be held personally accountable for enabling child abuse on an international scale. If we let it come to that, ISKCON may never recover. If ISKCON will not invest the resources necessary to protect and care for these children, then the only responsible thing to do is to shut down these schools. Allowing business to continue as usual is criminal. If the GBC wish to conduct a review of CPO policies, this review needs to be transparent and it needs to be carried out by unbiased and professional individuals, and certainly not by Lakshmi Moni's lawyer buddies. Investing in child protection is in everyone's best interest, the children, the leaders and society at large. It is time to bring the 1% of TOVP money proposal back to the discussion table. The way ISKCON addresses child abuse could very well be the defining factor that determines the future existence and purity of Srila Prabhupada's legacy. Thank you for your time. Hare Krishna. विपालयंतम् लक्ष्मी सहस्रसतोक सम्रमासे बमानम् गोविन्दम् हादेपरशम् तमा हम भजामी